Okay, my name is Fiona King and I work at the National College of Art and Design. I work in the education faculty. And really, how I was introduced to development education was about eight years ago. And we work um, with the Ubuntu network, which is housed in University of Limerick. And they support us in initial teacher education to look at ways in which our student teachers can embed development education into the lens of their subject area. So I deliver a development education intervention in NCAD, and I also deliver a development education intervention in TCD. So what we're going to discuss today really is, I suppose, our way in and how we explore development education through imagery, and in particular, how we mind map and visually mind map. And this is a specific methodology that we use a huge amount in the National College of Art and Design, but it's very much also a generic methodology that can be used across subject disciplines. So I think also today what you're doing very much is you're probably reflecting on your practice as educators and you're looking at what are the possibilities, how are you? <laughs> what are the possibilities of development education and how can I push it through my subject area? And I think what's very important is that you push it through in a very considered way and a very meaningful way. And the, one of the things that we did in the National College of Art and Design, and I think the first point of entry was to look at why are we going to do this? And I think this is what you will probably be reflecting on today. Like, how will it be meaningful within our subject area and how does it enhance and enrich our subject area? So some of the ideas that we came up with, and this, some of them are specific to art education, but also some of them are very specific also to, to any subject area. And the first thing was that we are authors of our own curriculum in terms of the art, craft and design syllabus. We're dealing with a very reductive syllabus and it's very much exam driven. It's also very much outcome based and it's not very process led. So this was an interesting way to introduce diverse themes and themes that the students could maybe connect with from their own personal experience. Also it was a way in for us to look at imagery and to look at contemporary art practice. And contemporary art practice also in particular, it, there's not much reference to it within our syllabus. So they could look at socially engaged art practice, they could look at how they can unpack art in the 21st century, look beyond the traditional methods of art, and look at also how, vo how art is a voice, and how you can visually express yourself, and also look at a range of different ways and mediums that you can use. Also in terms of, I suppose, everybody's subject area here, it's connecting with the relevance of today's learners. And the fact that, again, they can have a voice. They can link in with what's happening within their community. They can also collaborate with their peers. And they can kind of take ownership of the educational process and know that education can extend beyond the classroom walls. So what they says, say have meaning. And also then the transformative effect of an educational process. And I think this is very important that they look at their values and they look at their attitudes. And they also work collectively. And I suppose they look at you know, others', others opinions, others' ideas. And I think this was really the range of reasons why we decided, yes, this is a good idea to embed this within the art, craft, and design curriculum. And then the other thing was, <clears throat> I suppose, the idea of how are we going to do this. And I think it was probably right there in front of us that obviously we should do it through imagery. But as a starting point, we did find it quite challenging, even understanding what development education was understanding the context of development. We didn't know if we were developing ourselves, if we were developing our students, and to unpack what underpins that, the human rights issues, the social justice issues, and the environmental concerns. So one of the eureka moments that we had is we saw Mark Edwards' work, and he is a person that you really can all reference, particularly geography teachers. And his work, he, he creates this amazing visual narrative about climate change and climate instability. And he charts the course of how climate change has impacted on human development. And I suppose the extremes of this. And also he looks at famine, he looks at conflict, and he by trade is a photojournalist. He also works with Salgado, who would be another very famous photojournalist. But what's interesting about this as well is he presents a visual narrative that links in with Bob Dylan's lyrics. So he actually uses the lyrics of the Hard Rain song, which was all about the Cuban Missile Crisis. But for, for this piece of work, he tells a different narrative and he tells a different story. 
and it's that of sustainability, it's that of our actions, um, and also it's about, I suppose, the intervention of man and how he can destroy communities and how he can destroy the environment by his actions. So it's just a beautiful way. Now, it's quite harrowing and they're quite haunting, some of the image, but it engages an audience, you know, to start speaking about these issues, to kind of, you know, unpack the dialogue. And also what's interesting about his work is that he presents it in very different contexts so that you could be walking along the street and it's there presented. He also presented it in the Botanic Gardens, I think it was a couple of years ago. He's presented it in Times Square. So I suppose it engages the public audience to look at issues and to look at them through a visual medium. Okay. So then the other, the other thing that we look at as well is we go back and look at traditional, sorry, I've just pressed on there, I'll go back. We look at traditional, traditional, modes of representation and we go back to painting Now, this very much links in again with the art craft and design syllabus and this particular image which is of Guernica you may be familiar with it it's Picasso's image and here it really documents conflict and demonstrates the extremes of conflict looks at how it impacts on a community and again I think you know it's it's this thing of engaging an audience looking at the composition looking how the images unfold and sometimes a painting in fact can have more of a presence than an actual image taken from a photograph and what also is interesting about this particular image is that when colin powell addressed the un security council about his, his impending invasion in iraq um, and when they were going to find and root out saddam hussein and also they were going to find these supposed weapons of destruction is that when he gave this address this actual image happened to be behind him in the, in the UN Security Council building in New York and what they did is actually cover it because it was such an extreme image because he was there presenting what he was going to do, the fact that he was going to invade a country, trying to put a positive spin on it and then obviously behind him was this image of the actual atrocities of war and the extremes of war and the impact of that on civilians. So it was covered. So it's an interesting story to show, I suppose, the power of the image and how it can affect a community. So in terms, again, I suppose, of linking in with your curriculum and linking in with your syllabus, and one thing we're all being asked to do across subject disciplines is to look at literacy and to look at numeracy. But in particular, when you're responding to images and when you're enabling pupils to respond and to interpret and to explore images, you're looking at oracy and you're looking at critical literacy. And this is what's really important. You're giving them ownership, you're giving them the ability to have opinions, you're engaging as a collective within a classroom. And by doing that, you're giving them a range of skills such as decoding, interpreting, and then also making judgment on the validity of an image. So you're also, I suppose, ticking the boxes because we are asking, there is so many demands in our subject areas nowadays. But I think again, it's to do it in a considered way and to do it in a meaningful way. So in terms of, again, our way in when we are working with imagery. And this is, again, what we do and how we approach it in the National College of Art and Design. One of the first questions that we started to ask was, what do you value? And this is actually difficult to translate this into the classroom because often when you say to students, what do you value? I mean, what is the first thing that might come up with when you ask students? Absolutely, they're talking about their phones, they're talking about their iPads. So it's a, to unpack that further. And in some ways, why do they value their iPads or their phones? Absolutely, it's a sense of communication, it's that community that they belong to, it's how they express themselves. But it can be difficult because everybody has different values and everybody has different opinions. So often as well, what we would ask them is something like, what bothers you? And here I'm going to just give you a look of an entry point that we did in the National College of Art and Design and how they mind mapped about this idea of what bothers you. The starting point was literally, can you see what might be the starting point of this mind map? Now I know there's a range of images, but can you see what might be the starting point? The fridge was the starting point and what they were asked was what bothers you. And literally what they were looking at, because again, you're probably, you know, looking at how you start them off 
and very much engaging with the local as opposed to engaging with the global because it can be difficult for them to understand the context of what's happening in Africa. They really need to start from kind of what matters to them within their community. So what was asked on this day was what bothers you and one of the student teachers said, well what bothers me actually is the fact that I have a fridge and that it's going to cost me as much to replace the fridge as to actually get the fridge, the fridge just fixed. So this started a dialogue within the group and very much we always get them to work as a collective. And what they started off saying is, okay, well what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the fridge out and then the implication of that. So as in, we're looking at sustainable practices and I suppose we're going to the landfill, the local landfill and we're paying the amount that we have to pay to get rid of the fridge. But then what are the consequences of that? We pay for that, sorry, and then we go get rid of the fridge but then where does our rubbish actually end up? Where does it go to? Okay, and you follow that path, follow that timeline, you know, follow the kind of sustainability issues of that, you know, that it gets obviously pushed off to maybe places in China, places in India, then what exists on those landfills, the communities that exist on those landfills. So very much the starting point is from a local context and though how you follow a path of inquiry that gets you to other issues that are more global concerns. But again, it's kind of the starting point of being able to discuss around images, to be able to unpack them, and then to have everybody's voices heard. So what we're gonna get you to do, because in some ways what's very important about development education is that there's really four components to it as an educational process. And the first component really is looking at the knowledge base. And then the second component is the critical skills that you engage with once you have achieved a certain understanding of the issue you're going to look at. It's very important that the methodologies you use are active learning methodologies so that everybody is engaged in the process and that collective voice is heard. And also the key skills, I mean we all know when we're working within groups, the fact that we have to share, we have to listen to each other. You know, we have to evaluate, we have to assess, we debate. So all of those skills of working within a group. So it's very important that you st structure your development education classes around group and pair work, as opposed to just having, you know, individual work and whole class engagement. I mean, I think another thing that's very important to reflect on when you're having this experience of doing a mind map and working with visual imagery is also the fact that you're working within a group. And that's really important. I mean, what are the skills, you know, that are being generated by working within a group? You know, listening to each other, communicating with each other, sharing ideas. Also, what can be quite difficult for students is giving up ownership of ideas. You know, so giving everybody the chance to talk. Now, obviously, it's okay, it's much easier to do it. We're all adults here, you know, and there's, I suppose, a level, a level of being civil to each other, whereas it's quite different when the students are working within groups. But again, it's that learning experience and very much when we implement a development education lesson, it's all about the group, it's all about the collective or working even within pairs and the shared experience of that then because that's part of the learning experience. I've learned more probably talking here this morning than I have in a long while on this issue because what's emerging is the incredible complexity of addressing any of the topics. So I'm, I'm not sure that um, I could even put it together, but it happens that our pictures um, all featured children and, um, you know, the issues that came through, the issues, uh, you know, I suppose, we, you know, the instinctive thing, of course, is the issues of, of the, the underlying causes, the compassion that we see in the pictures. But then to, trying to get to those base causes really interested everybody and, um, you know, getting past what's, what's, what is um, superficially to be seen. So coming at it from the questioning point of view, we were trying to go in three areas, in the lower order and the higher order questions. So what, what you can see, and that alone raises huge questions, the visuals and the compositions of the pictures, all featuring children and the universal experience for everybody. So I'm bringing, and then one of the things that came back for us at our table was that in fact all of these issues are very relevant at home. The home is uh, issues, uh, unemployment, poverty, food poverty, and um, you know, we didn't have to go to these countries. So other complexities arose because we're all, most people are working in schools which are um, multiracial cohorts of children. So this isn't about talking about places 
over there anymore. It's about children who have the heritage and the culture in your classroom and how, how you deal with that. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a really skillfully, has to be really skillfully handled. Um, so I don't know if I have any, any questions, any, any overarching uh, ideas about how to really pull it all together, but we did feel that the, going at it, I see, really looking at the detail of what's there uh, in the picture can you know, be enormously helpful because it's, a, it's a, such a complex thing. One picture we did uh, single out is the one to, nearest to Lizzie. Kind of, kind of, we kind of felt it pulled together everything that we were looking at, um, the child on the railway tracks. But in the background, the huge amount of development that's there. Um, so that's side by side, wealth and poverty, the extremes, yeah. And that's probably in all the societies. Um, what else were we thinking about then? And then taking the questions, yeah, like what do we see? And then what do we think? You know, what do we think has happened? Why is this child there? What has caused these situations? And then taking it forward, you know, to the last point, um, the what ifs, what would we do? Why? Yeah. You know, um, and trying to take it into the higher order question. And we had a whole series of questions that we could have dealt with there, a whole range of questions. Yeah, and I think it's also to look beyond the image, you know, and to question about that. You know, as in you see something very much in the image and you can describe that, but you know, what could be on the image, be beyond the image? You know, but it also it is what you could reflect on as well is sometimes maybe there's too much imagery that we're working with in a mind map. So you might decide to maybe only use one or two images and just isolate them. And again, maybe the context of coming from a local, like everything went back to the local and everything nearly comes from the local. So again, it's linking in with their experience because otherwise it can, it can be very difficult. You know, and I think a lady over there as well spoke about, you know, even the terminology that surrounds development education. You know, we're, we're stuck on what does development mean? You know, and we don't have an understanding of that. I mean, when you talk about citizenship education and you talk about, you know, even, you know, the, the I suppose, themes that you link in with development education, like homelessness, you know, like famine, you know, like disease, they understand what you're talking about, but the framing of development education, like a lot of people are probably doing development education, you know, in their subject areas, but it's just not framed within development education, you know, and that can be complex. Okay, well, I, this, the, we have to choose a picture. So we chose this one in the center, and I'll just read out what it says. It might make it easier for you to understand where we are coming from. Um, there is a lady at a, at a cash register, she's doing her food shopping, and the manager of the supermarket says, are you okay with binning the food you won't eat at home, or would you, madam, like us to do it for you here and now? And then instead of a, her, instead of a, a shopping trolley, there's a small uh, skip where she's just chucking the food in before she even gets to work higher. So um, our whole issue was, um, I mean, again, it was very complex. We jumped from topic to topic, but um, I guess if we had to put one uh, point on it, it would be the use of the land and uh, the use of the Earth's resources. So, um, I mean, we talked about over here we have um, a picture of, a, of, of um, a man just digging up some potatoes, and we were asking the question about fertilizers and whether, uh, you know, the, whether do we need fertilizers in order to fulfill the global demand for food? And uh, do we need genetically modified crops in order to fulfill the global demand for food? Or, and is this whole idea of organic, um, organic food just a sort of a nice middle class uh, way of looking at food? And you know, is it really practical? So I guess there's a link between uh, global and and the local issue there, which you know, we kind of kept bouncing off. And you can see lots of pictures here, and um, the one at the bottom of the children uh, uh, collecting water. The gentleman here at the bottom of the picture, whose whose uh, whose land has dried up, and there's obviously serious drought. And then somehow we linked, um, well, in a very intelligent way, which I, I'm going to remember in a minute, uh, we, we managed to link um, the issue of the youth resources to um, uh, homelessness and to um, uh, you know, this idea of, um, of, of housing and the expansion of housing for to make it more economically friendly, that's how we did it actually, uh, through being economically friendly. So there's a picture at the top there of uh, some slum huts in um, Mumbai in India. And it's a head, actually a headline from a paper underneath. Uh, the caption reads, forget eco homes and look to the Mumbai slums, Kevin MacLeod urges British government. So that 
this idea of trying to build a more economically friendly house is it's a bit of a it's a bit of a uh, it's not really the way to go because it, w it would be better if we dealt with the issue of homelessness first before you know trying to become a very smart um, you know eco-friendly uh, globe r rather than solving some of the more local problems and uh, there's another picture of homelessness here which um, which we managed to link in um, through that issue so it was it was a really fascinating discussion we kind of we hit so many different topics, it was, it was really it was great. Um, like anybody else, we had really different photographs submitted, um, uh, kind of some very artistic and others very topical. Um, conflict dominated, that's a photo from Palestine, and um, that's a photograph from the Great Depression in America. And um, so we had to find our overarching uh, theme, so um, this was the one we ended up focusing on, and um, it's very artistic. Um, and it's the idea of sort of access through doors and access through steps and the fact that the steps take up nearly 50% of the photo and actually from a disability point of view are a block to access. You know, so that became our sort of overriding theme, this idea of inequality. Um, so um, just looking at that then, um, you know, working out through our thought process, this one of these children is a little girl and one of these children is a little boy and it's impossible to tell which is which, but they will have a very different path in life based on their gender. Um, we looked at recession and how um, uh, I suppose inequality becomes more uh, pointed in a recession, um, and that allowed us to kind of think as well about local issues, and this is a very you know, Dublin-like image as well, so we can kind of keep it local as well. Um, and then this is Afghanistan, and this is Palestine, this is the Suez uprising, you know, so we, we, you know, conflict and I suppose inequality sort of came together there. Um, our questions were similar, and um, unpacking the image was um, the key point, and dealing with the lower order questions, very, very simply, quite, what, describe what you see. You know, so, you know, if they start talking about doors and steps and women and children and, um, a uh, man holding his child, you know, that they can understand just exactly what they're looking at, first of all. And then we moved quite quickly then, I, just, I think that's the nature of this topic, into higher higher order questions. Um, so the next question was, well, what dominates each image? You know, so the best steps very clearly dominate this image. The woman's face and, and that wonderful expression dominates that image. The man holding his, his dead son and um, dominates that image and the, the light is all on him and darkness dominates this image this is a um a drug addict um in afghanistan it's a huge issue in afghanistan which i didn't really know <laughs> until we had this discussion um, so uh, moving on from that then um would you know we had a range of possible questions would they see contrast with what contrast in the images um, and who's behind the lens that was one that we were sort of Helped with a bit, but, um, uh, you know what's going on because you can almost see the photographer in this 1920s, 30s image. You can nearly see the photographer behind the hood taking the photo, you know, um, and you can almost see somebody, you know, in a wheelchair looking up in this image as well. The, the perspective is, is very interesting. Um, so, uh, who was behind the image, and then finally, who was responsible? And that was the kind of question that we was fairly open ended, but you know, it would be nice if they started thinking that way towards the end of the. Of the whole thought process. So, um, so that was us. So I think what's excellent in particular about this mind map is that the images in some ways are quite veiled so that it doesn't say exactly what the image is about. It's not in any way stereotypical, it's not in any way reductive, but it draws you in, even as you say, from the perspective of you know how you're looking at it. And then how, you know, obviously a disabled person might be looking at, you know, access and entry into a building. So I think some ways, and it's, it's something I suppose to hopefully take away from this, is that often an image that you're not really certain about that you have to unpack it can be just as effective as an image that looks at maybe, you know, a global issue and has, you know, looks at an African community. You know, so it's to use images, to get confident about using images, and I think that's what's also very important, is that when you choose your image, you go through a process of understanding, you know, contextualizing where you found it, why you were drawn to it, so that you can then present this to your pupils. 
because you know I think that's what's important because it would lead you in then to being able to create a bank of questions around the image and feel confident you know when you're talking about it so listen I just want to say thank you very much because I think everybody learned very much from yourselves today there's a real community of practice here and I also think what's important is that to look at how you can embed it within your subject area that development education you know, human rights, social justice issues, whatever you choose to do, environmental concerns, it's not just one standalone lesson. Look at your syllabus area and see the possibilities within your syllabus area in senior or junior cycle, and then how you can embed an issue that you are interested in, and can even maybe link in with the exam as well. Okay, so listen, thank you very much anyway for today.